And there it goes. Oh, it's back. Okay, you've got one more shot. So any questions about anything before I jump into this? Okay. So this lecture is uh, titled Capital. It covers a very long period of time. And this large theme of capital uh, is intended to cover many, many sub-themes, which I've tried to capture in this slide. Uh, before we get to these individual examples of each city, I try to give you a hint as to what the key issue is that's at work as I go through each of these examples. And you'll notice this is an extremely European lecture. It starts with uh, a group of tiny countries in Europe that otherwise are nobody on the world stage. And they suddenly get control of ocean, long distance ocean bound uh, ships. And that changes everything in human history. It happens around uh, the middle of the 15th century. You've heard of Christopher Columbo, uh, Columbus in the United States. Um, and uh, all those explorers, you studied them uh, several times in elementary school. Well, now we're going to study it again in a certain way uh, and the impact that followed. It covers uh, some five centuries of history. And so there's a lot of ground to cover. And it's really a recap of a lot of history you've had before. But this time, we're going to look at the operation of cities and how formal, spatial, institutional arrangements are not just passive reflections of what's going on in history, right? If, if you think architecture is just a passive reflection of what's happening in the world, think again. Architecture and the urbanism that uh, comes out of it is very much an active instrument that makes these things possible. And you'll notice down here that we get into issues of power. Politics permeate throughout this lecture. What does architecture do to control people? And how does it do it? How does architecture do what it does? And it's a difficult lecture to give uh, at this moment in time because we, the discipline of architecture, <clears throat> have a long history of denying the instrumentality of architecture. Your professors in studio and myself all went to school at a time when we were taught there's no connection between politics and architecture. Architecture is this high aspiration of human uh, ambitions uh, of a glorious history of civilization. It's not about the politics. Uh, not so fast. Maybe there is some politics when it comes to architecture. And especially when you get at the larger scale impacts of architecture. When you're no longer framing the beautiful building tightly in your camera for the cover of the architectural magazine, what's happening outside that frame? Uh, as Iwan Bon, the photographer, do you know Iwan Bon? Um, any, uh, do you know Rem Kohlhaas? Do you know Stephen Hall? Do you know fill in the blank? What architects do you know? Okay, he's an except. Anyone who's alive today and practicing today. Any architect. Philip Johnson. He just died, right? He died a while ago. But Shigeru Ban. Any architect that you know, that you can picture their work in your head, there is an 80% chance that the photographer of that picture was Iwan Ban. And he became the world's foremost photographer by breaking two of the primary rules. I can't believe that word. Alhamdulillah. So 
uh, he broke two of the primary rules of architecture. Rule number one, don't let people ruin your, your photo. Rule number two, don't let the urban context ruin your photo. He does both. He takes pictures of people in the setting of architecture, and he takes pictures of architecture in the setting of the city. So we get to this very basic question, when is a map more than just a record of the territory? This has come up before, right? When does this come up before in class? When, does it, when is a map more than just a passive record of the world? Well, your analysis is an assertion you're, you're drawing out of it. And, but I'm talking about the stuff you are analyzing. The stuff you're analyzing uh, was mapped, and then it was built. So when it's a plan, when it's an architectural plan, it's not a passive reflection of the world. And sometimes architectural plans are very large. They take on the scale of an entire map in some cases, an entire continent. Remember that road in the middle of the farmland that took a, a sudden 90 degree turn and then back again? That's a, a, an example of a very large floor plan. That uh, it's a floor plan of the continent of the United States and it results in very bizarre situations. And so um, the first theme is corporate corporations and their role in the colonial project. Uh, this is something that I recently published, uh, and I, it struck me that it was actually quite useful example of this class, for this class. Um, back to those tiny little uh, nations in the north of Europe that suddenly got the ability to sail on the oceans and travel the world. Remember, Christopher Columbus was a little bit confused about uh, how big the ocean was and what was on the other side of it. He thought China was on the other side of, of that ocean, um, and that's how he discovered uh, the Americas. So the Dutch, the uh, Spanish, the Portuguese were the first, uh, but they used these ships to establish uh, trade relationships around the world. And the architecture of that trade relationship on both ends of it are what uh, is a mixed use architecturally of a shop house. That people live in it, a family lives in the shop house, and uh, there, is, uh, there is commerce going on. And uh, if your eyes are glued to your screen, it uh, makes me feel like I'm wasting my time. So uh, I, I'm going to be checking for the whites of your eyes. So if you need to close your screens, that would be great. Unless you're taking notes, please close your screens. Um, so these are two shop houses. One is a Chinese shop house. It happens, these happen at the on the Asian side, where Chinese uh, settlements have, were developed in port cities all over the Indian Ocean and the uh, South China Sea. And this is a Dutch shop house. Uh, they're ostensibly different forms, but they perform very similar functions. Uh, in the Dutch shop house, there is a canal uh, on one side and a street on, on the other. And there is uh, like a factory element going on one side, a shop, and then the family lives here. And in the upper stories, it's a warehouse. It's storage of goods. And those goods are likely to have come from a shop house like this, where 
there's a factory in the rear, uh, the residence up above, and this functions to a large extent as a shop and a, a space of production. And in each case, they are connected to canals uh, because it is almost free to transport very heavy things when it's floating on water. Uh, it, the physics of this is remarkable, it's miraculous. Uh, the physics is such that uh, the friction is so low that the energy inputs are extremely low. And even to the present, if you're worried about global warming and you think it's crazy that uh, we're getting bottled drinking water from Fiji on the other side of the planet, um, paying $3 a bottle sometimes, yes, that is crazy. But the carbon footprint of bringing that water over here by ship is extremely low. The carbon footprint of bringing it from the port to uh, the convenience store where you bought it is higher than the carbon footprint of bringing that water from Fiji to Boston. So this is a uh, picture of all the places the Dutch uh, established trade connections and colonized. Um, this is uh, what is today known as Indonesia. Um, include, it includes large parts of New England. Uh, this tiny little country, because they had ships, uh, were able to do this. But was it just because they had ships? It wasn't just because they had ships. It also had to do with a few other things. Some of them are architectural. So uh, on the other side of the world, in the city that they established, they burned down a, a fishing port, uh, conquered it, and then they, uh, they pushed all the, the indigenous peoples of the fishing port outside the walls, and they built a wall. And they made a replica of Amsterdam because they need to be able to bring the ships in deep and connect to wherever the goods are being kept uh, put those on the boats and then bring them out and uh, load them onto uh, large sailing vessels and then sail it back to the Netherlands. And so the thesis here is that, do I have a picture of, okay, there should be, um, so picture the city of Amsterdam with all its canals. Really, uh, to, to state it, Bluntly, these two cities of Batavia and Jakarta are so intertwined uh, to, so as to make them a single system. Amsterdam and Batavia grew at almost the exact same time, at the sa exact same level, uh, with very similar forms. Of the, the relationship that matters architecturally is between the canal a key, which is a little open area in, uh, between the canal and the, the shop house, and then the shop house. And it's all about reducing the effort and energy it takes to move large quantities of commodities from the upper stories of these shop houses down to the key, onto the boats, out to the ships, across to the other place. And mainly it was a flow from here to Amsterdam. Uh, and this city uh, was an instrument of making that flow of commodities possible. This was a large piece of architecture that had a job to do. It had to control a large population of workers who were loading and unloading commodities that were being brought from all over, especially those places called the Spice Islands, remember? Um, the Spice Islands from your history class. Basically, the Dutch and the English were competing to establish a monopoly, a global monopoly, on a few sp precious spices that everybody wanted and would pay any amount of money for. So it was highly uh, price inelastic, to use economic terms, that no matter how high you took the price, people would still want cloves, nutmeg, and mace during the holidays even poor people would buy a tiny amount of nutmeg because that was the fancy cell phone at the time. That was the way people distinguished themselves and said, 
I may be uh, a fishmonger, but I have class. Taste the nutmeg in my holiday meal. So they would pay any price for nutmeg. The Dutch and the English competed. The Dutch won this battle. They established a monopoly on cloves in part by trading a tiny island called Run in Southeast Asia for another island uh, in their colonial holdings. They traded this tiny little island of Run that you've never heard of for the island of Manhattan, which you have heard of. And on the Dutch side, here's how it really happened. These journeys to the other side of the world were extremely risky. One out of four of those journeys would result in absolute loss of all cargo, all life, a total financial disaster. So it was very difficult to get people to invest in these long distance journeys because they might make it rich and retire forever because when you load a boat full of very lightweight nutmeg, uh, you're set for life. Um, but if the ship sinks, you're screwed. So what they did is they established these pieces of paper. And these pieces of paper said, um, they're basically, this was the invention of the joint stock company. And the Dutch established a company that said, we're gonna, for the next 10 years, we're gonna take, we're gonna take your money that you're investing in our company to buy our stock. We're gonna take hundreds of journeys to uh, Java, and some of those ships are gonna sink. But enough of them are gonna make it that overall, we will make you wealthy. It worked brilliantly. Everyone wanted a piece of the action, and so the Dutch East India Company became the first multinational corporation in history it became the largest multinational corporation in history. No one has yet to top the Dutch East India Company in terms of size and power. They had their own armies. They could vanquish nations. They could massacre entire populations. They could declare war, which they did several times against the Spanish and the English, to protect their, uh, their, the value of their stock. Now, how does it work that you trust a piece of paper. Who in their right mind would invest their life savings to buy a piece of paper? How do you know that they're gonna make good on it? The answer is architecture. This is the uh, Amsterdam Exchange. Each column was identified uh, at, in the trade of one thing or another. These gentlemen are at the column associated with the renting of the upper stories of shop houses throughout Amsterdam. And so anyone who needs a place to store their cloves or nutmeg would come and see these gentlemen and they would rent them storage space. These guys are uh, trading in timber from uh, what we now call um, Sweden and Norway. So uh, there was a, this is the original open market. So if there were, where there are throngs of people, there are lots of people bidding up and down the price for anything. And see how they're dressed? There were, there were rules of decorum. No spitting, no cursing, no dogs, no women. Just polite gentlemen engaging in business. And, uh, uh, and it was, a, it was a mechanism. This architecture was a machine for developing trust. It was built on top of the main canal, the Damrock, in uh, the Eye the River in Amsterdam. Who's been there? I have probably asked you before. Anyone been there? You will. Uh, so that uh, if they wanted to inspect the goods, one could just go out and see the goods that were <coughs> in the boats along the pier or stored in these warehouse um, cells below the stock trading floor. So because there was a mechanism for accountability, they did not need to use it. This is coming up now in the realm of cryptocurrency, 
why would anyone buy cryptocurrency? Who trusts that it has any value? So suddenly, and the right answer is, well, why do you think the dollar bill has any value? So far, it's worked in practice. It has a long history of being dependable. Uh, it's not until uh, the economy collapses that we'll start to question that. So if, uh, here's the Amsterdam Exchange. Here's the main river of Amsterdam, the original river of Amsterdam. This is uh, the first place where this water body was crossed. This is where the fishing boats first uh, settled, and there's still a fish market there. There's, um, here is the Bureau of Weights and Measures. So when they weigh out a certain amount of fish or other commodities, the government, which is the city of Amsterdam, because it's a city-state at this time, is guaranteeing the accuracy and dependability of the weights. So there is a, a spatial relationship between these three institutions that is crucial. If I have a doubt, you know, if I think, you know, you're shortchanging me. I got home last time and, and you shorted me uh, way too much. Uh, you can call on the authorities uh, because they're right there. Do you do that? You don't have to because a level of trust and dependability has been established in part because I can see the government regulator from the stall where I'm purchasing the items. Yes, right. Is that still the... Uh Yes, but it's not there anymore. We've despatialized a lot of these things. But we still refer to the architecture. We refer to open markets. We refer to open and free markets. That's where that term was born. Anyone can come in here and trade if you're a man and an adult. So no children, no dogs, no women. How about other races? You always are talking about race every chance you get. Yes, other races are welcome because that's part of global trade. It would be impractical to not allow our, our fellow traders from Saudi Arabia uh, and Persia and all these other regions. Some of the paintings that I've looked at in this uh, depictions of these spaces uh, show men in turbans. No end. Um, so what's this one? This is Town Hall, and it has the Visselbank, and that is the bank that <coughs> you can take your promissory notes to, and they will give you gold. Right. So this is another institution that is crucial for establishing the trust <coughs> upon which these paper stock um, instruments are, depend. Without trust, there is no joint stock company. Without the joint stock company, there is no long distance sea trade between uh, Europe and Asia. Uh, the Portuguese and the Spanish uh, during the 16th century controlled the seas. And they did it through royal monarchy, monopolies to their cronies. Uh, but the volume of trade was extremely limited because even though they are kings and queens of Portugal and Spain, there's not that much money. And half of their project was about converting the savages to Christianity. So theirs was a mixed mission of bringing gold and silver, pillaging gold and silver from the Americas, uh, and, and trading in spices with uh, India, but also converting savages to Christianity. And that, that was their mission. Uh, it, when, when England and the Netherlands developed this trick of the joint stock corporation, it exploded. It went viral. All of a sudden, they had uh, all the money they needed to do whatever they wanted, including uh, conquer new countries. So that's what's going on in the 16th century and the 17th century. But that's not all that's going on. 
This is going to feel like a completely different topic at this point, but they come together when we get to, to uh, Paris and the other examples that anchor this lecture. So this is the work of Serlio, an architect uh, working in the 15th century, and this is a stage set. And this is the, the classic stage set of the time where you depict the public open space of a fine city. And so the design of the stage set w established, both reflected and uh, further reproduced, those aspects of architecture that constitute a proper civilized stage set upon which the drama of human society plays out. We are all just merely players on the stage of life. And this is the setting, and this is the architecture. So you have a monumental gate, you have major landmarks to navigate you in space, you have a staircase going off, and you have a collection of very dignified facades that frame, remember the conversation, that frame this space. And uh, this is where life occurs. How deep is this? What's the distance from here to there? What would you guess? meter, so each square. I'm, I'm looking in the foreground, comparing the step. I know what a step is, right? You know what a step is. That's like a foot. And so this is three or four feet wide. So this must be three or four feet deep, because these are squares, right? Gotcha. Right? What's really going on here? Probably about It's a trick, right? Yeah. So these are not parallel lines. They're actually converging. This is really only maybe 10, 20, might be 20, 30 feet. Uh, all of these buildings are built using diagonal. None of these lines are parallel. It's a trick of the eye. It's an optical illusion. It is called foreshortening, right? You studied that at some point? Did you study it in history theory when you were doing the history of architecture? Did you look at any of this foreshortening optical illusion in architecture? In Venice. In Venice? You look at any like play set, right? And that's kind of the idea. Any like theater performance set? Yeah, like, the, it, yeah. you do it in theaters. Does anyone do theater in high school? No? no? Okay. So this is how uh, during the Renaissance, art and architecture discovered perspective. The thing that you've been doing with your computers and sometimes you construct it uh, manually. I think you learned how to do that in first year. Or you learned how to construct a perspective. Vanishing point, horizon line, remember all that? Well, that, it wasn't just a drawing technique that they invented in the Renaissance. They employed it in architecture. They said, when people, Michelangelo said, when people come up these stairs, I want them to be impressed with th this Campidoglio space at the top of the Capitoline Hill in Rome. I want them to be impressed. So I'm going to use that trick. But what's going on here compared to what Serlio did in his stage set? Serlio is doing this. Michelangelo is doing this. Why? Why would Michelangelo do the opposite of Serlio? If Serlio was trying to make it seem much deeper by doing this, what is Michelangelo? I would still say it has a vanishing point, though. Still, it still has a vanishing point? It's still like, converging, right? But it's, but it's converging behind you instead of converging ahead of you. Yeah, and when, yeah. when you look at it, it's making it more welcoming. Because when you walk into the space, it expands. Oh, oh. In front of it, it. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking at it from the drawing perspective, as to, in terms of like the drawing has been. Like, but yeah, I, yeah. So we should, I should <laughs> I have given you a lower eye point because when you look at this from lower down, like here's another one, Bernini. A hundred years later, Bernini is doing it at St. Peter's in Rome. So that both of these are in Rome, but a uh, hundred years apart, Michelangelo, Bernini, they're both doing almost the same thing. 
It's almost the same angle. But in either case, I could have given you, and I'll try to change that for the next group, uh, I could have given you a view from here. What do we see when we stand here? We don't, our brain, just like in the Serlio thing, our brain assumes these lines are parallel. And so all of a sudden, rather than making that seem farther away, it makes it seem closer. That's not the goal. The goal is to make this seem taller. It's hard to make things tall. Uh, it's easy to make, or it's easier to make things wider. By doing this, they actually make, uh, we assume that whatever horizontal distance in the foreground we're experiencing is the same, translates here, but it doesn't. It's, it's radiating out, and so that makes it seem farther away, and it makes this seem taller. And so that is the object of this, is to make these things seem much grander. Has anyone been to St. Peter's in, in Rome? Rome? Yeah. yeah. Have you walked through those colonnades? What was the first thing you experienced, if you remember? I just remember it being overwhelming. Because it right? was like, so big that you couldn't really like notice it, the like sort of perspective changes from the ground level but when like you're walking in like around it it was more obvious mm -hmm. that was the whole point behind this so that the facade of the basilica overwhelms you you no longer see what's around it you no longer experience what's around it and it immediately dwarfs everything yeah so the um so this is the vision part. Like, what is it about how we see that becomes available as a, a trick or an operation of architecture and urban form? Uh, so around the time, about 100 years after Columbus discovered America, the pope in Rome, Sixtus V, said, hey. I don't know if he said hey. He probably said it in Latin. Uh, he said, hey, he said the equivalent of hey in Latin. He said, hey, let's, let's have a jubilee year. What's a jubilee year? It's like the mini renaissance. No? Uh, no. I'm going to say no. All right. Fair enough. So who's the Catholic? Who's Catholic? Who was raised Catholic? Jubilee, how about indulgences? Purgatory? <laughs> Who was your Sunday school teacher? My mother was my Sunday school teacher. And she was very strict. <laughs> I had to learn all this stuff. So, okay, let's go through it again. When we die, we go to purgatory. And we hang out in purgatory for what seems like forever before the judgment day in which then we're separated into those who go to heaven and those who go to hell. Right? Everyone's with me so far? Crazy, right? Well, it gets crazier. Who wants to spend all this time in purgatory? Raise your hand if you want to spend all this time in purgatory. Would you rather get straight to heaven? Assuming you're not going to hell. <laughs> you're all lovely people. I'm sure no one's going to hell. So let's assume we're all going to heaven. We've got to hang out in purgatory. Is there anything we can do to shorten our time in purgatory? Uh, be good. Here's how the Catholic Church defined being good. You can visit the churches in which the relics of Christ's time on earth are actually stored. So thus was born the tourism industry. It started as a Catholic institution of pilgrimage. You go to the Cathedral of Chartres because they had the Shroud of Turin. No, they didn't have the Shroud of Turin. Turin had the Shroud they of Turin. They had the original cross at some point. They had a, a shard of the original cross or something. Every church had a piece of the cross or the shroud or the thorns or a bone of a saint. Santiago de Compostela. The so if you walk to these places, you earn indulgences. It's like frequent flyer miles, only instead of getting free flights, you get time off of your, your time in purgatory. 
almost as real. Um, and so if you crawl instead of walking, you get more indulgences. If you, I'm serious, if you go on a jubilee year, you get bonus points. You get like double or triple or quadruple your, your indulgence points, right? So who wouldn't? But how many indulgences does it take to get down to zero time in purgatory? No one knows. No one knows. That's convenient. <laughs> What's another way to get indulgences to take your time off? Spend money. Spend money. Thank you. Exactly. How do they pay for this? Indulgences. Right? Ka-ching. That's money in the bank. So. Pope Sixtus V, remember him? He says, let's have a jubilee year. Let's get these people here. We need a little boost. We need a kick in the economic ka-ching box. And so he said, let's market it. So he made this pamphlet. He said, look, you go to this pilgrimage site, and then you go to this pilgrimage site, and you go to this. Look, it's all laid out. And there are straight visual alignments between each pilgrimage site just to make it easy. And there's the pamphlet version and the advertising that was printed in, throughout Europe. And here's uh, Edmund Bacon's uh, an anal analysis of it at later times. So you come in through uh, Piazza del Popolo and you see the, the three different directions, uh, the Spanish steps. These are all the pilgrimage sites. They used to be outside of Rome. This is Rome where the Pantheon is, the Capitoline Hill. Uh, the Forum. Um, so this was out in the countryside beyond the walls of Rome. Now it's inside Rome. That's something we're going to see over and over again. Does that make sense? And so this was one of the clearest examples of establishing these visual alignments that uh, has a power of attracting people, of moving people, of supporting a story of great greatness whether that greatness is uh, the, time, the times of Jesus uh, on our planet, or in this case, what's, what's the power here? Do you recognize this? Paris, yeah, it's Versailles. Did you study this? Yeah. Oh, good, overlap. We love overlap. <laughs> so here's Versailles, alignments of power directly related to what Sixtus V did in Rome. These guys, uh, Laveau and uh, the guy who took over from Laveau, they'd been to Rome, they knew how these visual axes worked, and they needed to give it to their, their king, Louis XIV, as a demonstration of power. So here it is. I guess that's this view. And again, using foreshortening. See how elongated that is? We're picturing it being square, but we're seeing it out in the distance. We can't really get a demonstration. But optical illusions and foreshortening are part of the game. This is why you hire an architect to create demonstrations of power. It's not just a reflection of power. It's an instrument of power. This is how you make Paris great again. I think you should either you should flip the, the plan view around because it's opposite the direction of the picture. I think you're right. Mm. Yeah, because you see the angle at the bottom. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's go to London. London had a fire in 1666, the Great Fire of London. This is London beforehand. What a mess. Then the fire hit and it took out this whole area. And so what do architects do after disaster? As then, as in uh, after the tsunami in Sumatra, when I was one of those flooding in, the place was crawling with architects wanting to save the world by their brilliance. Um, uh, architects flood in and they say, oh, let's, this is our chance to remake London as a proper city. Recognize the patterns here? Um, Evelyn, Wren, and Hook. The same Hook 
that you studied in structures class. Uh, he was amazing. He, anyway, we don't have time to talk about Hook. But Hook is same rational grid, but with squares in the middle. You've seen that in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, Evelyn is saying, let's do a proper Baroque town plan as it was in Sixtus V's Rome, as it is in Versailles. Let's do something grand and put uh, St. Paul's Cathedral right at the center of the visual lines. So Christopher Wren said, yeah, OK, but uh, let's not go too crazy. And he was a little bit more realistic. And he, he was, at the time of the fire, he was renovating uh, St. Paul's. And um, this is how he wanted to redo the area around St. Paul's. Um, and again, you have, you have the old fabric of London that burned, and then you have the new imprint of the streets. But there were a few things that kept them from doing this. They were never able to remake London uh, uh, according to any of these plans. Because, and same thing I ran into in Sumatra uh, after the tsunami, uh, people own these lands. These lots, these parcels are associated with the owners. And those owners are not going to just give up their property just because it burned down. That's all they have is the claim to that land in the center of London. Um, if you're going to take away my property rights, you've got to pay me a lot of money. Do they have the money to pay everyone what they need to pay? Isn't this, this would be like during the time of the monarchy, right? 1666, definitely monarchy so, times. But no, it was, around, it was actually around the, um, the parliamentary revolutions. That's a good question. I mean, like, couldn't the king just be like, give me your land? Yeah, not, not as parliament. You know, the kings in England, it's not like the king of France. They were increasingly account, held accountable by parliament. 16, uh, I'll make it part of the lecture next time. Thank you for bringing that up skip that. They didn't have the money. Okay, I'm planting the seed for the next topic. Remember that. They didn't have the money, so they couldn't do it. So basically, they rebuilt London with the streets in the exact same place, because infrastructure is hard to move. Remember that. Next topic, industry. So uh, starting around the 13th century, the feudal system in England was weakening. What's the feudal system? You are all peasants. I am the king. I'm the lord of the realm. You farm the land. You give me 20% and you can keep the rest. <coughs> you don't own the land. I, own the, I am the lord. The king of England owns all the lands. Right? So you don't own the lands, but you have rights to farm it because you are the peasantry that supports the feudal system. Who's with me? You got it? So what happens? They get the fever of land ownership. Land ownership is awesome. I want to be like the king. I'm just a lord. I want to be like a king. I want to own these lands. So the acts of enclosure emerge over the course of several centuries. It's not until around the time of the Industrial Revolution that the acts of enclosure take off. Basically, you peasants, move off the land, move into these villages, but still farm the land, but you don't get to keep 80% of what you grow. I'll pay you a wage. I get all the produce that is produced. Got it? Good, right? So that's the acts of enclosure. That it was a, a widespread taking of the commons, what had been called the commons, and expropriating those, thing, those lands and putting them in the hands of local noble, nobles and thus reducing the prospects of the peasantry to mere wage labor. And, um, and as the population grew, you had excess wage labor uh, and you didn't have the ability to make a living. So about that time, um, 
as part of the parliamentary system in England, you had a, a sudden spurt of innovation. And <clears throat> in France, when someone invented something, they went to the king, and the king uh, said, that's a labor-saving device. If, if, we, if you're allowed to uh, develop that invention, that will cause the dislocation of, of my, my, uh, peasant, my peasantry. That will result in revolution. Uh, give your drawings to my good friend, the uh, deputy clerk, and see my other friend outside in the hall. They throw him into jail, kill him, and bury the ideas. So who's going to innovate? Let's go. Let's innovate. We're in France. Who's, who's with me? Let's innovate. No one? You're very smart. So in France, in China, in Turkey, in all these places throughout Africa, all these places where innovation uh, happens naturally, it is suppressed institutionally, routinely, as uh, the part of the process. The thing that makes England special is they suddenly refrain from suppressing innovation in that way because of fear of the disruption. And so suddenly, there's the steam engine, there's uh, the spinning jenny, there's a series of innovations that you studied in elementary school, so we don't need to. And they tend to be water powered. How does water power work? Uh, the water comes in this side of the factory, it drives the wheel, and leaves the factory at a lower point. Um, in each of these cases, these are vertical shaft water wheels. The water is coming in at a high point and departing at a low point. You just get that little bit into the section. And water weighs a lot. Eight, my, my half gallon of milk weighs eight pounds. Right? So imagine all those eight pound half gallons of milk pouring through here, dropping. The, the distance of the drop is what uh, generates the power. So the secret weapon is to find a place where the river drops. Uh, the most, and that gives you great power. You can you can run the factory, literal power, not political power. Um, here's a, here's an illustration uh, from Pugin. We're getting into the idea of what we do in analysis. This is the connection. Pugin was saying, "Hey, in the medieval city, it was moral. It was it was godly. Look at all the steeples. Look at the." the peasants farming on the outskirts and the uh, trade of the merchants on, in the sight of God. And there was a moral, ethical, he was saying this is good, and then he was saying this is bad. Look at these factories that are growing up all around the water sources in England. What's this in the foreground? You've seen this character before. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. What? Yeah. No, close. Close? Prisons. Prisons. How'd you know? Yes. Who said that? Panopticon. Panopticon. Uh, you said that? No, I mean like. Who said prison? Oh, okay, point? Point. Yeah. Panopticon. Central control. And, it, and the poorhouse. This is when you can't pay your debts, you go to the poorhouse. If you're stealing, you go to the penitentiary. Where are the steeples? They're buried in the, in the factories, in the smokestacks. What a bad situation. So what's happening there is Pugin is making an argument. He's using uh, an elevated point of view, like we do. He's showing the formal spatial arrangement of the urban pattern in the background. Does that ring a bell? The architectural scale in the foreground, including human beings, so you can kind of project yourself into the scene and see which of these two worlds you'd rather be in. So, oh, I'd much rather be in this world. Success, right? He's using these architectural representations to support an argument. He's not doing analysis uh, because he's making the drawing himself. He's, this is more of a proposal. So we've mentioned Edward Tufte before. What did we say about Edward Tufte? Who's going to earn the points? 
There are points to be, yes? Was it good at like display like graphic? Like it was like graphics and statistics and stuff like that? Yes, again, the answer to the question is in the caption. Um, but yes, you are recalling correctly that uh, Edward Tufte is the father of information design. The, the theory of information design, which makes it different from graphic design, is that the meaning is a product not just of the content, but as much or more in the way that content is displayed, is presented. <laughs> is visualized. So you've heard of data visualization, I suspect. That is all an Edward Tufte thing, starting in the 80s. So this is his paradigmatic demonstration uh, in the work of Menard uh, a century earlier. Menard is showing the War of 1812 when Napoleon marched from the Prussian border on Moscow. And he started out with this big of a force. And then one group broke off, another group broke off. They're engaging in battle, and so their numbers are depleting. Holy cow, they're not stopping, even though they have a time, they have like a quarter of the people they started with. And then the, the horrible retreat from Moscow, uh, where their numbers go down even further, right? I could show you this in the spreadsheet, and you'd say, but you look at it this way, and it's like, oh, right? It's like, remember all the tiny houses in the Dutch demonstration of what uh, 300,000 houses look like? That's like, oh, oh my god, that's big. That's, that's the power of what we do as architects, is we present visualizations that uh, do the job of not just giving you the information, but also delivering an impact. And that's what's happening here. But there's another thing that happens. It's not just about manipulating us emotionally. It's also figuring out what's going on. Remember, number one source of understanding is the world itself. And architectural representations give us a privileged access to understanding the world. Tufti's privileged access is being demonstrated here um, uh, or Menard's uh, genius in the display of information is he put in the temperature. Uh, it was so cold, so it's the march back. So he aligned the temperature with the march back. October, it's um, 26 degrees, if I'm reading it right. It's cold. But then it gets colder. Now it's uh, 30 to uh, uh, 20, I don't know, 21 degrees. It gets colder and colder, and more and more people are dying. You're dying because it's so damn cold. And you see that because you see the drop in temperature. The numbers aren't making sense to me. Um, but the, uh, the graphic, at each point, they're recording the temperature, and it's not good. Does that make sense? So using that, uh, here's another example that Tufti loves to use when he gives his presentations, and he puts them in his books. In London, we're back in London now, with the Industrial Revolution going full boom, uh, people crowding off of the lands that they're being displaced by the lands of laws of enclosure. They're being pushed into cities where the factories are located. The cities are growing up, like in Manchester. Remember Manchester from the reading? Uh, the cities are growing up where the water is dropping. Where a river drops, that's where you locate your factory because of the physics of water. And so people are crowding into these cities, and they are dying by the tens and hundreds of thousands because of cholera epidemics. The cities of Europe, for, uh, for about a century, experienced periodic outbreaks where one-third to one-half of the population would perish. It was devastating. Um, and here's a case, and the theory was that cholera spread through the air. If you could smell something bad, 
you were at risk of getting infected by cholera. It was called miasma. And so uh, Parliament had to close up one year because the Thames was so stinky that uh, they soaked the curtains in lime on the idea that it would disinfect the air as it came through the curtains. But still, the parliamentarians didn't want to hold Parliament because they were afraid of catching cholera because they could smell the Thames River. Well, around the same time, Dr. Jon Snow, no, not the character from Game of Thrones, the other Jon Snow, the first Jon Snow, he said, hey, let's look at the deaths and let's look at where the deaths are occurring. So this is his analysis of the urban form before, see, see what we had to do before there was Google Earth? Um, and he put a coffin where in every household where a body had to be taken away. And so he said, what's up with this? There's an awful lot of death right around here, and there's a pump. He looked at where all the public pumps were. There's a pump right here on Broad Street. I, I uh, hypothesize that cholera is not spread through the air. Cholera is spread through the water. These people are dying because they're getting their water from one contaminated pump. I hereby petition the authorities of the district to remove the pump handle. That's what they did, and the cholera stopped. This was one well that was infected by someone's cesspool and causing all the cholera deaths. So even though we knew this, we continued to be obsessed with light and air. And that's not such a bad thing. The, you know the building codes now. Uh, you're in comprehensive studio. So you know that uh, every bedroom, every room in the house except for bathrooms and closets need to have a window. It's the law, right? You knew that? Um, question? No. You just yeah. gathering your points? OK, that's good. Point, point, point. Um, so the, uh, but back then, they thought it was a matter of life and death. And so the housing laws were all reflecting uh, the obsession over light and air. Light coming into a room has a disinfecting quality. Air movement will dissipate the miasma. And so the housing in the factory towns uh, were designed to reduce the frequency and depth of the cholera death. So here we go. There's a bunch of these. Uh, basically, you can see that there's a river that drops right here. See all the white? Um, and many of you grew up in a town that was just like this, or near a town that was just like this. Maybe this town. This is Lewiston, Maine. Who grew up there? Lewiston? Um, who grew up in a town or nearby uh, a town that had old factory mill buildings? So what town? It's, it's Lowell. Lowell. Which one? Worcester. Worcester. Lawrence. Lawrence. One of my favorites. Lawrence. Marlboro. Marlboro. Yeah, so this is the story of the settlement of New England. Uh, it, New England is blessed with many large rivers that drop precipitously. What do you do? You capture the water when it's at its high point. You bring it in a canal flat. So each of you who you should be able to picture in each of those towns where that canal might be. Here it's still visible, but in many of your towns it's been covered over. That's where they put the rail line. That's where they put the main street um, that cuts through downtown. But in many cases the canal is still exposed and visible. This one has two canals. And it's dropping here to generate electricity. 
And so, the, but the original construction is you grab the water at its high point and you drop it in pipes. If you can contain it in a pipe, none of you have taken a bath in decades, so a decade or more, so you don't remember how water works. But water in a pipe, um, and just trust me, or take a bath if you want to test it with your bath toys, right? So the water will go through here and drive the machinery. And so the, the, the original foundation of these towns all reflect this. Here's the waterfall up here. You grab the water, uh, and you take it in a flat canal all the way through here, and you drop it through each of these factories, and you use it to drive all these things. Now, how, who's working in these mills, uh, and how are they getting there? They didn't have SUVs, and they didn't have streetcars because they weren't fancy people. They walked. Mill workers had to move to the mill towns, and they walked to work. So each of these towns has uh, a, the remnants of a large residential fabric um, still. You can see fragments of it here and there that now uh, a lot of immigrants from Cambodia, in the case of Lawrence and Laos, um, move into. Then came the railways. And the railways leave their own trace on the, on the landscape. Uh, sometimes the railway geometries are obliterated, but uh, this is an example of um, the railways. You can see certain continuities just from the geometry of the arrangement of buildings. It used to be that you would bring things to and from the factory towns by the same water if you were, had a clear path to the sea, or if you had canals around things for transportation. So the rivers were both a source of power and a, uh, a transportation system. But then came coal, steam locomotives, and the railway system. And so they became part of what uh, brought commodities to and from these towns. And so you see this repeated over and over again, not just in New England, but all over the world. And uh, this industrial landscape is still there. Here's another visualization by the same guy who did Napoleon's March. This is Menard's visualization of coal. And England was blessed with tons and tons of coal. And so steam power became uh, a replacement for water power. And suddenly, if you could get coal to your factory, you no longer had to depend on water power. And you could locate in different places, but they tended to stay where they were. They just converted from water power to coal power. Uh, and then also came steamships, which to a large extent is how this coal is getting where it is going uh, between 1850 and 1890. And the British Empire uh, becomes a thing because the Dutch East India Company uh, can't hold it together. And around, uh, when was it? I can't remember. But at a certain point, both the Dutch East India Company and the English East India Companies are taken over by the government. And the government is now the colonial power. And so now you have formal colonialism of England over everybody else. And there was a statement, the sun never sets on the British Empire. And it doesn't, because the British Empire had the Falklands, Suriname, Canada, um, a lot of Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Australia. The sun is always shining on one part of the British Empire. And that empire operates through the urban and architectural fabric of ports. And so now we're back to this whole thing that we were looking at with Amsterdam and Batavia as two halves of the same city separated by 20,000 kilometers of, of sea route. And this is what drove the Industrial Revolution. This is not the way I was taught this history. I thought, OK, the age of the great explorers, 
of European exploration, and then full stop, and then colonialism, and then full stop, and then if there's time, we'll study slavery, but we don't know who's got time for slavery, so let's not study slavery. It's just, uh, but the connections between those three things are deep and profound. There is no industrial revolution without colonial commodity exchange, and there's no none of this without slavery, without cheap labor. And the cities uh, decay into these smoky messes with the rise of coal power, and uh, these social comments are, uh, are used in the newspapers. They illustrate these cramped conditions uh, where people try to stay clean, they do their laundry, they hang it out to dry, and by the t even long before the linens are dry, there's a layer of black soot uh, on t sitting on top of it, and everything turns gray. No fun. And so these residential quarters uh, in close proximity to the industrial uh, uh, production. Does that ring a bell? Remember all this crazy stuff we talked about in previous lectures where Zoning was a thing where we needed to get industry away from residential. Uh, Tony Garnier's industrial city, the garden city, all of these things was to move the source of pollution far away from where uh, good Christians live uh, in the countryside. And so this is why that became a thing. The biggest problem faced by the 20th century was to overcome these problems in the 19th century that were a result of the Industrial Revolution. Now let's get to Frederick Engels. Remember that reading you did? So Frederick Engels was a factory worker's son, factory owner's son, very different. Factory owner's son, and daddy thought he was a lazy uh, slug laying on the couch playing video games all day. So he said, come on, let's put you to work. And so he brought him to Manchester, put him in the factories, and a weird thing happened. He didn't just say, okay, this is cool. I, I love my privilege, and I earned every cent of it uh, as if he were a Trump son. Uh, but he didn't, he didn't say that. He said, what's up with this? Look at these conditions. What's up with that? What explains this? And his friends tried to talk him out of it. They said, it's natural. You're a winner. They're losers uh, by whatever metric they want to apply. But they make the argument, and this is key. This is kind of the moment of truth here. They make the argument that this is the natural order of things. And something, I don't know what's wrong with young Fred. Freddy's, there's something wrong with Freddy. Have you noticed he's acting weird lately? He doesn't seem to get it. He doesn't want to accept that this is natural. He's saying, this is not natural. Uh, there are distinct forces at work that create these conditions. And it's optional. It's not inevitable. It is optional. Yes, Adam Smith, thank you very much. Wealth of Nations, The Invisible Hand. We talked about that in the reflex city. The, the ultimate reflexive mechanism in human history is the balancing, the automatic operation of supply and demand. Remember that graph? It moves to adjust itself. But Adam Smith also said, um, nothing's perfect. Uh, if, until, someday we will get to the condition of perfect competition, where so many different suppliers are offering comparable uh, items that the forces, the invisible hand of supply and demand will create the ultimate, the greatest positive outcome for the greatest number of people. But in the meantime, we need government regulation. We don't like government regulation, but there are things we call market failures, and there are other things, there are side effects. It's not, it's not on purpose. No one's doing this on purpose. There are side effects that occur that we call externalities. What is it external to? It's external to the operations of supply and demand, such as 
global climate change and planetary species death, including humans, that, in the language of economics of Adam Smith, is an externality. It's a pretty important externality. Uh, but it's an externality. There are no market forces that say it's bad if the human species goes extinct. Isn't that crazy? The, the rules of capitalism are, right now, whoever dumps the most pollution and pulls the most resources out of the planet gets the money. And so, under, everybody understand the rules? Okay, go. Go pay off your student debts. So what are you going to do? You are going to play by those rules because you have student loans. You're going to, if you're smart and you understand the system, you will grab as many resources out of the planet without paying uh, any real price for it because how do you price that? It's endless in theory. And then you're going to dump pollution into the atmosphere as much as you can get away with. Why not? The atmosphere is endless, at least in terms of economic models. So all of these things are externalities, and some of us would call them market failures. That's the language of capitalism. Um, but so what do you do? You find a way to price the things that you care about. You find a way to price and charge people money for dumping these things into the atmosphere you charge a fair price that reflects the scarcity of oil for the extraction of that commodity. It's no longer free. And so that's what a capitalist would do to solve the global climate crisis and species extinction. But this is a similar thing where uh, you have overcrowding in these inner alleys where there, everybody's sharing these cesspool uh, bathrooms. And you get Frederick Engels seeing this and writing about it and saying, um, this is not OK. We've got to figure out a way to change the rules of the game so that we reduce this harm. Uh, you say it's natural, but we can't afford to allow this to continue to be the status quo. Uh, and so he partners with his buddy. What's his buddy's name? He has a friend he, he gets together with. He's a journalist slash photographer? No. No, Jacob Reese comes later. But thank you. Point. His, his co-author. The next thing he writes is a little thing called the uh, Communist Manifesto. Uh, it wasn't Groucho. Marx. It was Karl Marx. So Frederick Engels the rich factory owner's son in Manchester co-authors the Communist Manifesto. Isn't it the Socialist Manifesto? Is it? I don't think it's. I don't think it became communism immediately. Well, the roots of that whole thing, that whole debacle, uh, are in the factory conditions of Manchester, and in the housing conditions. And here's one of our predecessors in the in the. Uh, mission to analyze urban fabric. Here we have uh, Booth's map of poverty of London. And he's showing the wealthy uh, facades of merchants' houses and stores along the high streets and in the inner blocks where there's uh, concealing of really poor housing conditions. Remember that in the reading? This is what it looks like. Um, Engels writes his thing, and then Booth goes to work and tries to map it in the city of London. And this is what it looks like. It is an urban form situation that is directly connected to the vision thing of these boulevards. This is not that different from the pilgrimage route, because this is the path taken by the carriages of the wealthy factory owners as they go off, as they pass through the town. They pass through these high streets, and they're, they're given the impression of opulence and wealth and bustling commerce and the success of merchant capitalism. They never see the inner blocks because they are screened by the architecture of all these facades. Um, here's a close-up.
And so here's the high street with the wall, the facades of the street are masking our view. And so we don't see the poverty and misery that's occurring inside those blocks. Uh, it's a perfect arrangement for reducing the visibility of poverty. It takes people like Gustave Doré, the uh, illustrator, who does all of these line drawings that I've been showing you in this lecture, uh, to publish these in the newspaper. And uh, novelists uh, like Charles Dickens to say, hey, life isn't all great in this fine city of London. We've got trouble. And here's the architectural analysis that goes along with what Dickens, Doré, uh, and others are doing. So picking up the pace, I have hundreds of slides of Paris and what happens next. Uh, but we have time only for the best of. Um, Paris is facing a similar plight. They have inner blocks that are just as bad or worse than London. And uh, Paris is a dangerous place. It's dangerous because of cholera. It's dangerous because of many other things. And so let's look at this. Did you study this in the history of architecture? The transformation of Paris by Hausmann? Does it ring a bell? So um, not surprised. That's OK. Um, uh, so the first problem we're going to talk about is cholera. This is a list, so you might want to write it down. It's a useful thing. Um, the first cause, the first desperate need to transform Paris what, that we're listing here, not, it wasn't necessarily the largest cause, but it's a convenient one to get out of the way, had cholera. They, they created the first modern sewer system. Here you see tourists getting a tour of the sewer system uh, under the streets of Paris. You can still take a tour of the sewer system of Paris. The second thing, who saw Les Miserables? Awesome, right? Did you see it in the movie or on Broadway? I didn't see both. You saw both as part of school? Yeah, so I, I watched the one in the theater. I mean, I actually had to watch the theater version of it uh, for my school, and then like, I actually just watched it with my parents yeah, with the movie. So how about those barricades? Talk about architecture, right? The way you saw it on Broadway? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh my god, incredible. I want that job designing the barricades that then rotate up and fold out of the way. Incredible. So the star of the show for me was the barricades. So here are the barricades. This is a daguerreotype photograph, one of the early photographs uh, back in the 19th century, uh, 1940, 1848, I believe, um, where we see barricades in these narrow streets, the communards, the revolutionaries, protesting the working conditions and the plight of the poor. Uh, rip up the streets, they create these barricades that we saw in Les Miserables, and then they uh, fight against the soldiers and die in the millions, not millions, thousands. Uh, a little bit of political context, which will become very important in a little bit. So in, the, in 1798, there's the French Revolution against the monarchy. They overthrow the king at that time and Marie Antoinette, who was the queen, and they establish the rule of three very key things liberté, which is freedom, égalité, which is equality, and fraternité, which is fraternity. But what's the American version of fraternity? Brotherhood. Right? So after these, these are established, France goes into a very tumultuous political period called La Terror, which lasts for around 50 or 60 years. And during it, there's cons consistent uprisings in order to better the conditions for the working class and the, and the poor and the farmers and the peasants, who were you know, infatuated by the slogan but never actually got any of these things that were promised. So that's why also there was like the erection of all of these barricades, there was a consistent sort of civilian struggle against the military powers in the city. And in that sense, Paris descended very dramatically into becoming a very dangerous place. In addition to the cholera, of course, and the, and the lack of a proper sewage system. And so the solution was, here you see some of the walls with the expansion. We'll get into this next week. 
uh, about how uh, cities in Europe expanded the walls. We talked about a little bit on Wednesday. Um, but um, they start, what Hausmann, Baron Hausmann does, is he says, let's take this mess of tangled, tiny back alleys where uh, these communards are building these barricades and staging these revolts, and let's draw a line on the map right through those neighborhoods. Ring a bell? Just like in the redlining of the US cities and the segregation, and then we build a freeway through it to clear it out. Well, Hausman uh, did it before Moses did it in New York. And so you create these wide boulevards in part because you can move troops quickly. Uh, it's actually the same argument used to justify the interstate highway system. And so you cut wide boulevards through these neighborhoods. You break up these uh, pockets of politically active uh, poor people. And you uh, also clear out a lot of the housing to reduce the population of the working poor. And you do that all over the place. And so here's one. I bet you could find a better version of this. Um, because this is not that clear. But you start to do this everywhere. And it becomes the housemanization of Paris, then uh, Hanoi, and then all the cities around the world take this on. Here's Edmund Bacon's analysis. And here's a student from a few years ago. But basically, um, it creates these moments. And this is a, a really important architectural moment to demonstrate how this works. If you did study this in history of architecture, it might have started and ended with this, the facade of the Paris Opera House. Um, but uh, you might have gone deeper in the section of the Paris Opera House. This little thing is the stage, and this is all the stuff that has, is the infrastructure in support of what happens on that stage. Here's the plan. This is the audience. Now we're back to Serlio. Instead of using uh, the illusion of distance, they create a stage with the depth uh, that is greater than the depth of the audience. And then there is a, a forecourt, basically, or this. What is all of this? If this is where the audience sits, and this is this huge, crazy space that could expand back to here if you want to create a greater vista, this is the depth of the backstage area. What is all of this? What is this for? The grand staircase. Yes. You have studied this. So here it is in section. Again, here's where the people, uh, the audiences. Here's uh, backstage with the fly loft and the rehearsal spaces where in the center it can actually uh, create a greater sense of depth. This is the, where the real show is. Because when you go to the opera, you go for two shows. The main show is the one that happens here. But the show that really matters in terms of uh, establishing yourself in society is the show that takes place here before, during intermission, and after. This is where you parade in your finest clothing. Uh, uh, arm in arm, and you are seen and you see. So you look at all the other lovely people of your class and status, and you are seen by all those people. And this is how the rise of the modern bourgeoisie is the French word, but what we were talking about is the middle class. This is the wealthy elite. All of a sudden, there is a class uh, that you could aspire to join because as a result of this revolution, it was no longer just the wealthiest 1% of the wealthiest 1% uh, royal family, and then uh, the vast sea of uh, people who are not even close to this degree of status and wealth. Suddenly, there's the rise of a new class of people. And if you can scrape together any money, you aspire to be in that class. And here's a student's representation of how it's not just here, but it continues out on the street. Uh, this is the st grand staircase where all of this occurs. 
And here is the Paris Opera House. Here's the Paris Opera House in Paris with its own Paris Boulevard. From the Louvre to the Paris Opera House, you take your carriage to here and you stroll along this boulevard gracefully to that grand area in the front to get the most out of this uh, display of wealth. And so uh, that's a picture of that. This is the grand staircase and the interplay of display of wealth in the opera house. And this is uh, the early emergence of the department store. Who goes to the mall to see and be seen? Your less friends. And less. Less, mm -hmm. what? less and less. Less and less. But this is where hanging out at the mall as a social activity became a thing. The opera house gets transferred to the mall, to these interior uh, walkways in the block. The, the housing situation, so here's where we look at the dwelling unit in relationship to the urban form. This is the classic boulevard housing situation. There might be a shop on the ground floor, but it might be um, the servants in the kitchen. This is the piano nobile, the main floor. This is, has higher ceilings, a chandelier, a fireplace. This is the luxury floor. And then this is the, the middle management floor. Uh, he has a family. Uh, the ceilings are not so bad. And this is where the renters are. Uh, up here, the struggling, you must pay the rent. I don't have the rent. You must pay the rent. And up here, it's the, um, the impoverished. There's the artist in the artist garret. It's cold and it's hot. It's miserable up here, but that's where the poor people. So you have a literal stratification of society vertically running down these uh, streets of Paris. No time. This is Versailles out here, <clears throat> and this is Paris. This is a very interesting analytical view of how these axial uh, arrangements proliferate and spread out. Here is the classic vision of what it means to be strolling on the streets of Paris. You dress up, you travel arm in arm, you look at each other, you are seeing who else is out, uh, and you are being seen by those who are out. Vienna did the same thing. Vienna had a, a fortification around it to protect itself again from Ottoman incursion. These are the fields of fire. It does no good if you crowd uh, urban fabric outside the walls. You need a clear field of fire so you can fire your cannon at any advancing forces so that you can see them, and if you can see them, you can hit them with a cannon or a rifle. And so that was the arrangement. When that was no longer a concern, uh, architects and designers, uh, Camilo Cite is a very important example of uh, architects designing for the development of the Ringstrasse around Vienna. And Cite is using his careful studies of how these courtyards, these plazas, and these streets uh, operate architecturally, especially in relationship to churches. And so he uses this analysis of figure ground urban form of cities throughout Europe uh, as his teacher. He is learning how the world works, what makes a good urban space, and he applies those lessons in the development of the Ringstrasse, publishing it in a book that is still available for us. And it happens in India. It happens in Hanoi. It happens in Saigon. It happens in Casablanca, Morocco. Uh, it happens in Barcelona. This is the one we're going to look at. There's old Barcelona. Here are a few towns around Barcelona. Um, they have a competition, not unlike London, but it's a few hundred years later. And again, you see uh, an example of all the ideas that are being um, traded around uh, Europe at the time. The Barcelona block becomes a very powerful thing, and that's what becomes the basis of Serdar's plan for Barcelona. And we see 
the very interesting, one of the great relationships uh, of the form of the street, the form of an inner courtyard, the form of the block, and relationship to the unit. That same relationship, very quickly, uh, is evolving in New York City where people are uh, crowding in tenements like the one I lived in when I was an architecture student, doing piecework, sitting by the window because that's where you can see it. The, uh, the grid of Manhattan is laid out in 1811. That grid, again, here's something that's very important for you to keep in mind when you're doing your um, analysis work. Um, is there was a relationship between housing type and the block shape. And the key here are the evolution of the tenement. First, with the light only coming from the front and back, maybe allowing a rear tenement as well, facing a courtyard, very much like the conditions that Engels is talking about. Then they pass a law in 1850 and say, no, you can't have these rear tenements. You actually, and you have to allow, you have to arrange the units so the light can penetrate in here. In order to make, to cram more people in, you put these air shafts, air and light shafts in the middle body, and you get the I, the I beam uh, tenement building, where light is coming from both ends, and then light is coming through these narrow air shafts to come into the kitchen dining areas. Uh, and that continues, this is the one I lived in when I was a student. This is a later one that, con that is characteristic of Harlem in the Upper West Side. And then increasingly, you get to uh, reducing the footprint of the buildings and increase the requirement for open ground plane. And that's the code requirements that you have to deal with uh, in your careers, is maximum ground coverage. You get the gangs of New York, uh, the flop houses where the factory workers will pay you know, five cents to sleep for six hours. Uh, and I could just quickly go through this because uh, it speaks for itself. This is the last thing. Mussolini, Casa del Fascio, 1920s, um, the, the house of fascism. So modern architecture had a role in the rise of fascism in Italy. But very quickly, these nationalistic uh, movements like Stalin's uh, Soviet, they went all conservative. They wanted to invoke the power of Rome. And here you see competing visions of the Soviet Union with Lenin leaning forward, the, the political stance of leaning forward. Well, actually, am I confused? I can't remember who's who, but it's Nazi Germany versus uh, Stalin's Soviet Union in 1937. There was um, an architecture student who didn't do so well. He failed out. You know what I'm going to say? Who's, who's the architecture student here? Hitler. Hitler. He's designing an opera house. Um, he goes on to design some very successful advertising campaigns, military uniforms, uh, the ubiquitous uh, Volkswagen Beetle. Yes. Um, and here he is breaking ground on this cool new thing that he kind of invented, the highway. I'd like to argue about the uniforms, because they looked good, but they weren't efficient. He also studied, he studied the power of hand gestures to communicate and to, because he was kind of, um, kind of a drunk lunatic, but he cleaned up well, and he became very effective. And he never stopped feeding his aspirations of architecture. When he was found dead in the bunker, it was very close to his beloved model of the transformation of Berlin as the capital of the Reich. He used architecture as an instrument of creating spectacle. And uh, it became a very important instrument of establishing his power over the country of Germany. Questions? Anything? Questions? More comments? Critique of the uniform? 
Okay, thank you. Sure. Oh wow, so you have selected oh, the magic wand. But I have these points, the yeah. codes, and the image kind of does a good job of explaining itself. So, that's, that's so I don't, I don't want to. Uh, Oh, yeah. Like, you can already see the dark path. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so how can I take it farther? Like, just so the fabric. So there are. You could uh, use the trick of highlighting just the facades. It's up to you. You could adjust the facades, or you could use the. Uh, you can see them here in the foreground. These specific building types that mask what happens deep in the deep in the yeah. that's, that's And I think maybe we're kind of during the day and turn into So the facades running down the street. Yeah. You know, framing the, the boulevard and uh, masking the mess that occurs in the non house boulevard. So maybe even just a line on the row of facades. Not coloring in the centers, and then highlighting the. Well, this one would be a good thing to uh, take the ground plane and give it a color, mm -hmm. because that's a space. It's defined it's by these facades. So, distinguishing between the ground plane and the facades is a good strategy. Okay, so the line as a ground plane, and then the facades, and then the center. The centers looks like a courtyard there. That. Since you're noticing it, that makes it a candidate. Yeah. And treat streets as a space, not a line. Okay. So there's an actual form that is visible here, and it ends where it's blocked by the cornice of that row of buildings. You know what I'm saying? It's not a straight line. It's not a... Right, there's trees in the way. Yeah. And so the trees deserve, deserve to be highlighted separately. Okay. Because they're part of the spectacle. And they're mm -hmm. part of the architecture, the form making. They block things. Uh, I need to run and meet.